I'm so excited about this episode. In it, I interview Catherine Woodward Thomas, New York Times bestselling author of Calling in the One and Conscious Uncoupling. And you will learn in this episode an amazing practice for helping your dreams get manifested and becoming the person who can enable that to happen in the world. Really thrilled about this, and I hope you enjoy the episode. If you've ever been disillusioned, disappointed, or discouraged in your search for love, and you know there has to be a better way to find the healthy, soul-filling love you've always longed for, then you've discovered the podcast for you. I know, as Ken's work personally has led me to find the love of my life. So here's your host of Deeper Dating, Ken Page. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Deeper Dating Podcast. I'm Ken Page, the host of the podcast, the author of the best-selling book, Deeper Dating, and the co-founder of DeeperDating.com, an online environment where people can meet in a way that is safe, inspiring, and positive. And today, I am so excited to have my dear friend, Catherine Woodward Thomas, with us. And I'm going to be telling you a lot more about Catherine in just one moment, but I just want to say that you can find a complete transcript of this and every other episode on deeperdatingpodcast.com. It'll have all the links to everything we're talking about here, and uh, it'll also speak about my upcoming Deeper Dating Intensive. And I just want to say also that what we talk about here is not medical or psychiatric advice. If you feel that you need that kind of help, I deeply encourage you to get it. And I also just want to say that if you like what you're learning here, what you're hearing here, I very much encourage you to learn all about Catherine's work and also to leave a review and to subscribe to this podcast. So Catherine Woodward Thomas, you are going to be speaking to us about awakening to your true love identity, and you are someone who lives in so many ways your true love identity. You are one of the most inspiring thought leaders I know in this field, and I adore you, and I'm happy to have you here. I'm so touched by that. Thank you. That brought little tears to my eyes. Oh. Because you're, you're, you're quite spectacular yourself Ken really (laughs) thank you Catherine so genuine and wise and caring you you just your heart is so big and and we get to be the recipients of it all the time so thank you for having me I'm really grateful to be here (laughs) thank you so much and let me tell you I mean I'm sure you all know about Catherine um but let me tell you about her so Catherine is a New York Times is the New York Times bestselling author of Conscious Uncoupling: Five Steps to Living Happily Ever After, and Calling in the One: Seven Weeks to Attracting the Love of Your Life, as well as an award-winning marriage and family psychotherapist. And over the past two decades, Catherine has had the honor of teaching hundreds and of thousands of people from all corners of the globe to create conscious, loving relationships and to re- realize the higher potential of all of their connections and what those connections hold for their health and happiness. And Catherine's going to be talking very much about that today in in her discussion about awakening to your true love identity. Catherine also trains and certifies people to become certified calling in the one coaches and or conscious uncoupling coaches. And she provides ongoing supervision and development to a vibrant community of her coaches from around the world. She is a billboard charting number one iTunes jazz artist as well with her CD Lucky in Love, which was co-written and co-produced with the brothers Corin. And she is also the author of Loving Out Loud, the most absolutely astounding daily inspiring newsletter, which I just encourage all of you to subscribe to. And all the links are going to be in the show notes. So Catherine, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. So I just want you to just start out uh, and tell us about because, because to me, I think about your journey as being so deeply linked to what you teach. So what brought you here and what has led you here? Oh, gosh, it certainly is. I mean, if you had asked me 30 years ago 
that I thought that I would be known for my teachings on how to manifest love and not just, you know, any love, but like the highest, the best, the healthiest, the happiest, I would have told you you were crazy because that was the mm. one area of my life that was a total disaster. Mm. And I had so much heartache around it. And, you know, all of us who struggle in, in the area of relationships, I mean, we're, we're pretty, you know, loving people. I had uh, work that I loved. I was very creative. I had a lot of, you know, I had a lot going for me. And it was confusing that I couldn't make love work. And it was very yeah. painful. I'd wanted to create a family for years. That was frustrated by a really per pervasive pattern of um, people who really couldn't be there for me. So, you know, any size, shape, form of unavailability somehow found their way to my doorstep. So I had a pattern with mar married men, mm. always attracted to me, always hitting on me. Uh, engaged men, alcoholic men. I had this joke, Ken, which she'll appreciate, which was gay men who wanted to explore had a thing for me. Mm. So it was always an impossible love. And, you know, I can say it now with humor and stuff, but it was painful and it yeah. was heartbreaking. Yeah. And, you know, I had you know, I had torn feelings about married men. Every once in a while, I'd get involved with somebody. It never went well. It was always a heartbreak waiting to happen. But, the, you know, but the pervasive, the pervasive experience is that no one was ever really there for me. Yeah, and I was pretty much on my own. So what turned it all around was not you know, the, the years that I spent in psychotherapy, I am a psychotherapist, but truthfully, that just helped me to understand why I was the way that I was. It didn't actually help me turn it around. Mm. And what finally turned it around is when I took on the metaphysical principle to set an intention for an unreasonable, unpredictable future. And uh, I did that by saying at the age of 42, or at the age of 41, I was going to be engaged by my 42nd birthday which was eight months out, no prospects at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, a friend of mine said something very, very impactful to me when I shared that with her. She said, Catherine, I'm going to hold that intention with you. And for you, if you give me permission to hold you accountable for being who you would need to be in order for that to happen. And that was such a gift from God, because instead of running out like a crazy person to try and find love or make something happen, I really went within at a deeper level and took responsibility for myself as the source of that pattern, even though it just felt like it was random, it was astrological, you know, it was my fate to be living this story. Uh, I just took it on like, no, I'm generating this, I'm creating this like a commitment. That's the lens I'm going to look through. And it really wasn't until I took that on, Ken, that things started to actually change. Oh, Yes. So and, brave, right? Yeah. Well, it it was like it was a, just a very mature, grown up thing to do. And I think that yeah. a lot of us are pretty sophisticated when we go like, "Well, why are you having struggles?" Well, my father was a narcissist, or my mother drank too much, or my mother went through postpartum, or my older brother was abusive. Now, all of that was probably true, and it's an interesting place to look. But if you notice, it it kind of leaves us powerless to still to change the pattern in the present. Mm. And it certainly leaves us powerless to create a positive possible future. So what I've come to understand over the years is that healing our past is a different domain than transforming our future. Beautiful. So transformation really belongs to the, 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 those of us who have the courage to say, you know, the buck of those old patterns stops here, even if it was passed through my lineage, exactly. stops here. Yes, and the yes. future I'm committed to creating is health, happiness, fulfillment. And to begin to then lean into the future that we need to, uh, we want to manifest, really discovering like how will I need to grow to become who I would need to be in order not just to manifest that future, but to have it go well when yes. I manifest that future. Some of us know the heartache of actually calling in a great relationship, and then it kind of dissolves with all of our history or the other person's history. We, we endure, we, you know, hit the wall of the complexities of all of that past that's unresolved, and then it, and then it, we, we, it just dissolves. 
in, in, a, in a way that's so heartbreaking because we never realize the potentials of that relationship. So how do we actually, <clears throat> you know, those of us who have a PhD in heartbreak, <laughs> how do we actually learn how to have a PhD in happiness and love? Mm. So I became a student in those four months. But, you know, when you take that context, you, you really stand for that. The first thing that comes up is, of course, all the things that's not that. So you really have to have the orientation of clearing away the past through the lens of how am I keeping the past? How am I keeping the past in my present? How am, what are the parts of me that are not on board for that future that are still stuck in past loyalties they're still, you know, somewhat ambivalent about having love because I don't trust myself to not give myself away. You know, we have to look at all of those things. But I found that the biggest obstacle was having an identity mm. that was inconsistent with the having of love. Absolutely. What what is called in psychology and self psychology, a self state, like an experience of self that's so deep, it's like burned into your being, it's who you are. And I so agree with you that that is at the very core of what needs to be healed and addressed and transformed. So one of the things that I really uh, confronted in my own calling in the one process <clears throat> was this deep sense of self that ultimately I was really alone in life mm. you know really when it comes down to it now all of us are pretty savvy about our beliefs most people here have an idea of what their core love identity might be you know few of us are newbies to this domain of personal development and we might even know the story about why we are the way we are so for me you know my mother worked when I was young. My mother was, first of all, just a teenager when she had me. She was very re reluctant to bond with me. My, my parents got married because they had to. It was back in the 50s. You married if you got pregnant. And, uh, and my father, and they had a terrible marriage. And my father left when I was probably about a year and a half old. Mm -hmm. My mother then was a full-time student and trying to get her own life together while she was saddled with you know a, a young baby mm -hmm. so it would leave me with sitters for hours at a time and all sorts of things and I was a latchkey kid so it's not rocket science that I would grow up and have this you know core orientation to life to to intimate love uh, that that no one was really there for me and I was pretty much on my own to figure it out what I mean by taking responsibility for ourselves as the source of the pattern so what I had to look at was that inside of that automatic assumption that I was alone, other people would either always leave me or never show up for me in the first place, that I had zero criteria that somebody would actually have to demonstrate that they had the capacity to show up for me before mm -hmm. I would go hook, line, and sinker with my heart all in. It just didn't even occur to me to have that as a criteria. Right. So that's a deeply concrete thing you're referring to now that changes the future. Yes. Thank you. So once you understand yourself, once you're looking through this lens and you're not looking through your psychology, but you're looking through the choices that you're making, the actions that you're taking or not taking, they're very concrete behavioral choices that are being generated from that core assumption. The first thing we have to do is not just change the behavior. We have to go right down to the root of it and change the core consciousness. And how we do that is I'm, is I'm going to actually, there's an exercise. I just want to tell you about it because you guys can do it. Oh, oh, that's beautiful. Can you actually lead the community in it right now? I would love to. I Fabulous. Would love to. And folks, you can just pause. Like if it, if there's a little bit of time, you could just pause the recording to go into the experience. This is fabulous. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay, Nate. great. So we're going to, what we're looking for right now is to identify what we call your false love identity. Mm. And that's the self that you you know, you might not start out dating from there. You might start out like, you know, that you have a lot to give and you're feeling great about yourself. It's when you start to feel dependent on someone 
or when somebody disappoints you or it doesn't go the way that you thought it was going to go, you start to get anxious, right? <clears throat> All that stuff comes up. That's when we can collapse into being overly identified with this story and not even know that we're now suddenly five years old, pretending to still be a grown up. But internally, you feel like you're five. That's because you're overly identified with the part of you that is anchored in the old story. So let's see if we can identify what that story is for you, because it's critical for you to know the story in, able, in order to be able to evolve beyond it. So if you're safe, if you feel safe to do so, I invite you to close your eyes and just take a nice deep breath. As though you could breathe all the way down into your hips. And I want to invite you to imagine that that pattern that consistently shows up in your life is happening yet again. And it, it might be as simple as you never get asked out, you're always alone on a Saturday night, or you always seem to wind up with really self-absorbed people who really are all about themselves, where you get give and give and give and you get depleted, but then the moment you need something for you, they're not there for you. Just see if you can land on one of the core patterns that you struggle with. And just imagine that it's happening again right now. Not, that person didn't call you back or you're being told again, that, I just want to be friends, you know, whatever that pattern is for you. And just use your imagination to imagine that, oof, it's happened. Like, and, and, and look in your body to see where you're holding the emotions of that pattern. Usually it's like a heaviness on your heart or it might be a knot in your solar plexus. Just see if you can find where that is again in your body. And put your hand on that part of yourself, send that part of you some love and just welcome in all of the feelings that you have about that. Just sending that part of you love, opening to feel whatever comes up for you in that pattern and seeing if you can actually name it as an I am or an I am not. Like for me, it was I'm alone and no one's ever really there for me. But it might also be I'm not good enough and other people are better than me. Or I'm invisible and no one really cares about my feelings and needs. See if you can actually give that part of your body where you're holding the emotional center of the pain of that pattern a voice to tell you who it is. What's the I am or I am not? And you might have more than one, so just honing in on the one that has the, the strongest energy. And then asking yourself, sweetheart, how old are you here? How old is this part of myself? And how big is the energy that's being held in this center? And again, just sending love to that part of you, opening your eyes, shaking it out, and asking yourself, what is the best thing about being me now at my current age, as opposed to me back then? All right, so now we're just really naming the story that comes up. That's where you have a default collapse in the face of disappointment or when you start to get really anxious that maybe you're more invested than the other person. So here's the thing. If we start acting from this center, we will have a tendency, particularly if we want to fix it, we will have a tendency to do things which actually generate evidence for that story. So let me give you another example of that. So inside of the I'm alone and, you know, everyone always leaves me or they never show up for me to begin with, I'm going to be really reticent to engage conflict or to really bring forth my true feelings and needs in a relationship because in my world, that's the beginning of the end. So not only does intimate relationship then require me to self-abandon constantly because I'm not speaking up and I'm not telling my truth, but it also prevents any relationship from actually bonding. 
because what we have learned from all the John Gottman studies that he's done is that conflict is what actually bonds people together. But if I see through my I'm alone lens that conflicts actually harms relationship and is the beginning of the end, I will not, I will not engage it. I will turn away from it. I will minimize the red flags. And essentially, I will fail to bond that relationship down to depth. Mm. So that's how I then become the source of all the evidence to the contrary. So how do we now deal with this? Because we don't want to have just more insights into why our relationships don't work. We want to be able to access the power to evolve beyond it. So one of the things we need to learn how to do is to differentiate the part of us that's holding strength, resources, development, intelligence, Now, that might sound like a hard thing to do, but just consider for a moment that if your best friend comes to you and they're kind of collapsed in a, you know, a puddle of tears because somebody just disappointed them and they're making it mean that they'll never find love, on a dime, you can show up from that competent, strong part of, wise part of yourself and say, sweetheart, let me tell you the truth here. That's not true. You know, look, this is disappointing. We kind of had an idea that this might happen, but it certainly does not mean that no one will ever love you, right? So you have a part of you. Maybe it's a part of you that shows up as a strong, competent uh, boss at work, or you're creative, or you have confidence on the stage. You have to locate that part of you and bring it into relationship with that tender, younger, traumatized self from your past that younger you, and you say, you almost imagine you could sit yourself down on your lap and say, sweetheart, let me tell you what's actually true about this story. Because that story is something you made up when you were too young to know any better. You know, children are always making meaning of their experience. It has to do with who am I and where do I fit in this world and what's possible for me in this lifetime. That's, that's our job as children. Yes. Right. So we're, we're, we're needing to intercept. There's this wonderful metaphysician named Neville Goddard who wrote a book called The Power of Awareness. And in that book, I love this quote so much. I actually have it on my desk. So you're going to see me look over to read it. Mm-hmm. You are free to choose the concept you will accept of yourself. Therefore, you possess the power of intervention, the mm-hmm. power of which enables you to alter the course of your future. So we want to intervene in that moment. And we want to go back and say, no, sweetheart, you are not born to be alone. You came here to love and be loved. It is your destiny to find great love. And you have the power to grow yourself healthy and strong to be able to create that relationship. Is that true? Yes, it's true. At my fingertips, I could just go to YouTube and spend days learning how to have better boundaries or speak up for myself or negotiate for my needs or differentiate between my unhealthy needs and my healthy needs. You know, all of these, all of these things that we didn't learn when we were young, because we were kind of alone. I mean, in my case, you know, there wasn't a teacher who was teaching me how to do that. Thank God for, you know, the whole movement of in schools now about emotional education, where we're actually valuing teaching these kinds of developmental skills to young people. But most of us didn't get them when we were young. Absolutely. You know, this was a wonderful exercise and I did it. And I, um, I'd love to share with you what came yeah. up for me. It was like a little Please. bit uh, in a different direction, but, <clears throat> but the process felt very powerful to me. So for me, there was the place of um, pain, upsetness, anger, when I feel that my husband is not meeting me at a place that's very sensitive or very needy. That was there. But that wasn't the biggest one. The biggest one was a feeling of I can't love, like I have hit a wall and I can't love. There's no love there. There's no love there. There's like no nothing there. Like, I can't do this. It's a deep, deep feeling that comes from my early childhood Holocaust survivor kid and like also being an HSP and not having the tools to be able to ask for what I need. So to me, like the existential hell place is 
I just can't love. Yeah, so it's like it, this deep existential aloneness where you can't connect with people. Is that the feeling? It's more like I'm not willing. It's more like I oh. am not willing. I am not going there. I am not going to feel that mm. there is a wall or like I can't, I just can't, which is kind of, that was my story. And it was the story mm. that I lived in my dating life, which fit in really beautifully with like the gay sex, you know, like um, crazy underground world. Like it fit in perfectly because yeah. I, you know, confronted that all the time, but never had to really confront it. So I did the process that you described. And it was fascinating because my life's work has been finding my way around that very place. So the part of me that has done all this work in finding out that I don't have to have that be true was actually able to be in dialogue with this very young place that said, mm -hmm. I got no choice. Like I'm numb. I'm numb. I want to get out of here. And, mm -hmm. um, that was a very wonderful thing to remember so, both of those. So the I am, how would you say that is an I am, this I can't love, I am. I am unable to love. I, I am, am unable I to love. I am unable to love. Okay, I am unable to love. And when you look from this very developed part of yourself and you're going to sit that, how old is he, by the way? The six. I am, he's six. You're going to imagine putting him right on your lap and just holding them close to you. And you're gonna be able to say what's, what's really true about this story. Are you asking me? Yeah, what? I yeah. am what? So what's really true is you had to shut down because it was just too much and the world didn't work for you. But and what's true about the idea that I am unable to love? Ah, uh, the truth is, that yeah. that is a trauma place and there are bypasses. And when you know the path through those crevices in the cave, you emerge into a world where you can love deeply and richly and amazingly and create the so, life that's so filled so with love. Can I, can, I, can I give you a suggestion? Oh yeah. I am a portal for love. Mm -hmm. The truth I is, am a portal for love. That's you beautiful. are. I am a portal, and love is endlessly available for me to give and receive. And I teach other people how to access this portal within themselves too. Yes, and that I have the gift of knowing how to get around the walls that I have learned how to do that because there are walls, there are holdbacks and those are gold. Those are beautiful. That's part of the terrain of protection. That's part of the terrain of reality. I, I would say that I'm a portal. I'm a portal who has, I have the map around trauma. I have a lot of map around trauma. Yeah, I, w I think when we're really in relationship, it's almost like we want to imagine. That's gorgeous, Ken. Thank you so much for modeling that. So I think what we want to do is learn how to hold that younger unsponsored self and begin to sponsor that self such that he surrenders. Because a lot of things, a lot of times when we know the truth just from our conscious mind or our cognitive self, we, we don't really have access to almost disappearing the other story in the sense that the deeper, wider center is going to always be the somatic self. The mm. somatic self is the self that's in charge, really. So that's why talk therapy sometimes doesn't quite work for a lot of us, because we're just kind of talking about the ideas. Well, I know that I'm worth love, but I don't feel like I'm worth love. So we have to almost get to the self that that is down to the hip. So let me just do a little exercise here about how I bring that down deeper and wider. Sure. Do we have time to do it? We sure do. We sure do. But I okay. just want to say one other piece that is exciting to me in what you're okay. talking about. Because okay. there's this process that you're describing. And then you also say, then what are the behaviors that bring you to that identity? 
And it's just so beautiful to go to the earliest core, to bring a wise teacher, and then to think, what are the practices that root me in that identity? So that's very exciting to me. That's just a very beautiful process. Yeah, this yeah. self is source piece. How am I the source of the ongoing experience? And how would I be? How can I be the source of evolving beyond it? That's yes. so true. Thank you. So in order to wake ourselves up, in a way that we feel in our bodies. And it's not mm -hmm. just some cognitive, mm -hmm. like right. you have these two parts of the self that kind of have different stories, but the one that's really, when you're in, you know, you're scared, the one that's running your love life is the self in the body. Cause of course we're also vulnerable when people get too close, you know? So what you do is I'll just breathe. I'll, I'll lead it. I'll just all through this part of it too. So Beautiful. let's have everyone close their eyes. So and, and I want to invite us all now to think of the things about yourself that are really wonderful about you, your strengths, your developed gifts, the places where you show up as a leader, where you are really wise beyond your years the part of you that's able to handle difficult situations, the part of you that others lean on and depend on because they see you as powerful, as competent, capable. And just breathing this strong, mature, adult, competent self, the one who has access to great wisdom and love, all the way down into your hips as if you could move that energy down into your body and even imagining you can extend the energy of the self down through your legs, out through the bottoms of your feet, extending the energy down into the earth and out to the edges of the room. And from this place of expansion, and strength, turning your attention towards that younger you in your body, extending your love to that younger self, saying to that younger self, I'm here and I've got you. I love you. I'm here. You're safe with me. I've got you. I see you. I know you. I love you. And I want to tell you what's really true about this idea that you're forming at the tender age of six when you can't possibly know what's true about you or whatever age came up for you. What's really true about this idea and speak words of wisdom and awakening to yourself. Really wake yourself up to the totality of who you came here to be, recognizing this challenge that you endured was really just part of the hero's journey for you. Just a moment that would imprint you with the opportunity to grow wisdom and compassion, to strengthen yourself and your gifts. But the truth about you is, and speak a soul truth, I came here to love and be loved. It is my destiny to love. I have the power to keep myself safe. I came here to be a teacher and a conduit of great levels of love in this world. I am not only able to love, I am the cause of love. I am the source of love. I am connected to the source of all of love. And see if you can come up with what we call a power statement, really anchoring that deeper truth. Who I am really is. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes and write that down. Mm. So sometimes it takes a while to really get this. You know, we have a very tiny amount of time and 
we might need more spaciousness for this. So if you're not quite getting it yet, it's fine. Sometimes it might, I mean, I've had it, I've worked with people where it took like two full days of this inquiry, like to really get that statement of truth. But what we're doing is we're, we're getting those two parts of you into relationship. And we want the, the part of you that's holding development, strength, and wisdom to be the deeper center. Yes. And just to say something about what you just said, Catherine, is that this was a quick exercise, but a very beautiful one. And I would imagine for all of those of you who feel like, well, I maybe didn't fully, fully get it, you partly got it. And just the act, this is an act of wisdom, to hold those beautiful places where you did get it and you did feel it and just allow those to be. Because I think all of us have experienced that from, from what you did and what you said, or probably almost all of us. So we can hold the beauty of the pieces that really healed us in that. Yeah, thank you, Ken. And, and I do have um, you know, I came here today, you were kind enough to invite me to be here today, because I have two workshops where we're going to be going even more deeply into this. They're 90 minute workshops, both of them are free to the community. This and is so, so exciting. Yeah, please uh, tell us, please tell us about this beautiful opportunity. Thank you. Well, one of the first one that I'm doing is, um, a webinar called Creating Your Future from the Future, Discover the Potent Secrets of Sourcing from the Future to Radically Heal and Transform Your Life. So if you notice, we started from the future. I'm going to set an outrageous intention that is unpredictable and unreasonable, but I'm going to lean in to start orienting myself to become who I'd need to be in order to manifest that future. And what we call that is the art of living from the possible self of the future backwards. And so it's... beautiful. So beautiful. <laughs> and and folks, pause whenever you want to just drink this in, metabolize it. Uh, such rich, beautiful stuff. Thank you, Ken. And then the second free 90 minute workshop is called Evolving Beyond Your Story. Discover the keys to finally graduating from your painful patterns in life and in love. And this is really the nuts and bolts about how to shift from being overly identified with our false love identity and waking ourselves to our true love identity so that we can actually generate our love life from that center. So I'm going to give you a, a more of a, a deeper dive into really being able to even recognize how to show up in new ways that are connected to that true love identity in a way that can manifest miracles and rapid, rapid transformation in your love life. So I'm really excited about sharing both of these free resources and, and, and hope that you can make it. If you can't make the actual call. So Ken has the link there for you to look and find out all the details about them. Um, but just sign up because we'll send you the recording. We'll be able to go deeper. Perfect. Perfect. Um, this is such beautiful work, such healing work and such real work because it goes down to the nitty gritty and then offers the antidote and then helps you craft the pathway through that. And this is how we heal. These kind of practices are how we heal our attachment wounds and shift our attachment style. That really does work. So um, I feel inside me the shift just from doing the exercises that, that you let us in. And uh, it's so wonderful that you're offering these opportunities for everybody. And I'm just so thrilled to be able to have had the opportunity to share this wisdom and these practices and these tools with our audience. Thank you, Ken. Me too. Thank you so much. Um, Catherine, I'm just going to ask you briefly, also uh, tell how people can reach you, how they can follow you, and how they can connect with your work. If you just go to my website, CatherineWoodwardThomas.com, uh, we do have the Love Out Loud messages that we're actually sending uh, every Sunday these days. And oh. they're, they're, they're brief, but poor poignant right to the core. Oh, teachings. they're gorgeous. They're gorgeous. <laughs> I sometimes write to Catherine and go, oh my God, was that beautiful? Yeah. 
yeah. it's kind of part poetry, it part is. part you know wisdom teaching around how to really actualize the higher potentials of love in our lives. Yes, it is. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here, my dear friend. Uh, you are a joy, and you are a fount of wisdom, and uh, I'm just so delighted to have you um, in this episode. Thank you, Ken. I look forward to being with you again real soon. And you're going to come in and uh, and talk to my community soon, too. I think we're going to have you as our guest faculty for the next coach training and calling in the one. And I can't wait to share Beautiful. your deeper dating work with everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, Catherine, Ken. it was so wonderful uh, to be with you. And thank you, everybody. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Deeper Dating Podcast. And that's it for today's episode of Deeper Dating. Be sure to go to deeperdatingpodcast.com as Ken has a few more gifts for you. Then join us on the next episode.